This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFP LP 101.9 FM. Community Television and the Chippewa Valley Sustainable Future Festival, One Family Story, Recovering from Western Civilization. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to be hearing about One Family Story, Recovering from Western Civilization. And Kent Whit Whitman is our presenter. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Kenton. He's the nature and outdoors columnist for the Dunn County News and the founder of Wee Wild University, a wilderness survival mindfulness martial arts school in Menominee, Wisconsin, that helps people recover from the mental, emotional, and physical ills of our culture and return to a more natural, joyful, eco-holistic, and healthy way of living. And I highly recommend after the presentation today that you check out his website. It's incredible. It wanted me to like go there right away to rewild the <laughs> So Kenton, take it away. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you all for coming. I was first asked to come and talk about our uh, year living in a yurt with my wife and our our daughter here, Mirabel, Rebecca and Mirabel. And so that's going to be included in the presentation, but I also wanted to include a lot of the lessons and, and things that we learn from, from our experience there. And so I'm going to begin sort of at the beginning with uh, our relationship we had. Rebecca just graduated from high school, and we decided that we were going to leave and find the Garden of Eden. So we headed up to northern Minnesota. <laughs> I had a teepee. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's really located there or not. But we had uh, this dream, this vision of finding a little piece of land in the woods. And there we would set up our teepee. And we would pluck the luscious ripe raspberries from the vine. We would fish from the clear streams. We would climb trees and lay in the field and watch the clouds drift by. And we got up there, and of course, we say now that we got scared. But I think what happened when we really look back is there was another process that was happening inside of us. And um, to me, it felt like when people have described to me coming off of, of drug addiction, and it felt like a withdrawal of all the things that we felt were familiar in life and made us feel secure. And up there, suddenly, we were going on this grand new adventure. And instead of being excited about it, we didn't feel emotionally capable to meet the challenge that we had put in front of us. And so, we turned around and we ran back to civilization, back to the real world. And this, despite you know, all the images there that give me this sense of ugh, freneticness, it felt ah, familiar and calm. We were back to something. You know, this, this we knew. And the real world, yeah. <laughs> That's what we call it. Um, we were living in Stevens Point and Wisconsin, kind of in the middle of Wisconsin. And we started working at jobs, doing what a young couple is supposed to do. You work, you get stuff, you know, and you work and you get. And we got, we got more and more stuff as we started to save up for the next vague vision of a dream, which had to do something with, with owning a house or some land or some other place that we were going to find this Eden that we hadn't found up in northern Minnesota. And we felt very much on autopilot at that time in our life. Again, it was just what a young couple does. You just you go to work and you you buy cars and you, you know, you're poor, so you buy cars that are almost dead, and then they get sent to the, to the landfill. And we were consuming a lot of resources. 
And I'd never even heard at that point, really, of sustainability. And a friend of mine invented this thing he called the flesh to steel ratio. And he said, what if we measure ourselves, our flesh, you know, my 145 pounds, against the steel, meaning the plastic, the metal, the rubber, the glass, everything else that we're constantly consuming. And, and how does that balance out? And hearing that for the first time was shocking, because I started to think about just one of those cars that we had purchased and sent to the dump. And that was so much beyond the weight of my flesh that it was inconceivable. And even though this was in our minds, you know, the thought of buying a house, and a house would be this huge amount of, of steel added to our equation, we still felt so secure in what we were doing that we just kept along that path. Um, we ended up moving to Menominee, and we would finally saved up enough to buy a little house in town. And this felt really sensible. The message we got from everybody around us was this, was a, this is what we're supposed to do. This makes sense. And so we had a house, and the value started to go up and up. It kind of skyrocketed, actually. And suddenly, we could see the vision of our next, our next Eden, which was this little house in the country. And there we would live happily ever after. And it's like, this American dream stuff really works, right? We bought the house, and the value went up, and then we had the down payment, and then we got our house in the country. Yay! We did it! <laughs> so that was, um, that was right back to the beginning. We were going to pluck the ripe, luscious raspberries off the vine and have that same vision that we had before. But something was wrong. And what was wrong is that the house, you know, needed repairs, and we had to work a lot to upkeep this home. And so we were not really getting any time to go out and pluck those raspberries. And we had six acres, and we envisioned ourselves camping out every night in the woods, and that just didn't really happen. So this was another big wake-up call and kind of confusing. Because this was supposed to be it. This was the answer. We had arrived, but it just didn't feel like we were there. And one of the biggest payments, of course, that we had, that most young couples have, is our mortgage payment. And that was to Bank of America. And so we started to kind of single out Bank of America as, as the essence of what was going wrong in, the, in our life at that time. And we, um, it was Brian Moynihan, I think that's how you pronounce his name, who is um, CEO of Bank of America. And he's making, I think, 12 million this year. And when we started to project out, figure things out, we looked and we said, there's Brian on the left, and there's all the little, each one of those represents one Kenton and Rebecca, 1,400 of us. It would take, we figured, just to provide for his salary. And it seemed to us like that was a lot of little Kenton and Rebecca's working away to try to provide for one man's salary. <laughs> and, of course, he's not the only exec at Bank of America. There's a team of 11 people. And Brian, even though he's the CEO, is not the highest paid. That's um, Thomas Montag at $14.5 million. There was David Darnell at 8.5, Bruce Thompson at 11.3, Gary Lynch at 8.7. And in researching this, I looked at their um, executive t 
team page and there was this quote that said, our team is committed to helping provide opportunities for our customers and clients throughout their financial lives. The problem was that the only opportunity that we felt like we were getting was the opportunity to work our butts off to pay for, the way we saw it, the salaries of some of these people. If we take just five of the top 11 executives, or the 11 executives working for Bank of America, it suddenly would take 6,500 of those little canars to pay off just the salary of these five people. You know, we had heard of the 1%, but this was starting to put it into a little bit of perspective for us. And it started to make a little bit of sense when we looked at everybody around us, including ourselves, working so hard all the time and never feeling like we could catch up or arrive at the destination that supposedly was at the end of this, this quest. There's an old word, peon. Has anybody heard of that word? <laughs> yeah. And that's how we started to feel, like we were a peon. And that, you know, that old word goes back to what was and is called debt bondage. And the definition of debt bondage is a pledge, a person's pledge of labor or services as repayment for a loan or debt. The way debt bondage works today, the definition that we use, um, they're referring to a very forceful and terrible practice that is um, banned by international law that is very akin to the slavery. But we still saw what was happening to us as, as a much more subtle and in a way more insidious because it was less direct form of debt bondage. And we thought of, you know, the average toddler in the US is seeing 20,000 ads a year and advertisements on TV. And the message that we're getting, starting as very young children, is you know, that you're insufficient in some way. Each of us is, we're too fat, we're too uncool, we're too this or that. If we're not drinking this beer or smoking that cigarette or driving this car, we're wearing these clothes. And most of us, by the time we're adults, have internalized this to some extent so that often, I mean, has anybody ever purchased something that they really actually didn't need, that didn't really add to your life in a positive way? Anybody out there? I see a couple <laughs> nods. Yeah, it's, it's like we all have this plugged into us enough that we go out and we see something shiny that we've been told is going to make our life better, and then we need to buy it and take it home. And continue that cycle of, of consumerism. The Bank of America executives are not, of course, the highest paid executives in the United States. As we researched it more, the situation became even more interesting. Uh, we have a couple of the top 100. And these are not the people at the top. But, you know, we have Michael Duke providing um, goods. <laughs> and coming out at 10.6, we have James Skinner helping us feed our um, SAD, our standard American diet, and going home with 27.7. Howard Schultz and Mr. Kent helping to fuel our sugar and stimulant addictions. And the list goes on there. The people are too small to see in this picture, right? <laughs> but the average US family 
the end of this, this kind of consumer thing that starts when we're toddlers, is that the average U.S. family is contributing about $48,000 to the economy in the form of buying cars and shoes and microwave ovens and iPads and printer paper and all the other stuff that we buy. And when we just, for fun here, took the top 100 earners and thought about that $48,000 contribution, if that money was just going to try to pay the salaries of those people, I'm not talking about any of the other operating costs of running any of these companies, just to pay the salaries of that top 100, there's 60,000 of us that have to contribute that $48,000 every year. That started to make us feel kind of ill. We, you know, in our microcosm, we were just working every day. We had, um, on paper, our situation looked good. We owned our own painting business, interior painting business, and it wasn't a heartfelt business, but it made money, right, so that we could help make our contribution. And, and it, we were directors of entertainment for a renaissance fair. That was pretty cool, and that was, that was fun work. But, but here was this feeling of, of sickness kind of creeping into our lives. And I like to almost think that, that the world responded, because our house got, started to get sick. And uh, hot water heater went out, the pump failed, it started to almost rain in through the, through the roof, the flat roof on the top, because we got a leak. And, and these things sort of hit all at once. Rebecca fell off a horse in that month and fractured her pelvis in two places. And we lost our contract with the painting, our big contract we had for our painting business. And the Renaissance Fair folded. And so suddenly, we were stuck with, with nothing. And it was strange because a month or two before that, we had been talking about, can we get out of this somehow? This just makes us feel sick. It doesn't feel right. We're not at our dream. This isn't working. But we felt really locked in. And maybe some people know what I'm talking about when I say that feeling of locked in. Like maybe you'd want to simplify your life, but you've got school debt to pay, or you know, you've got the mortgage or credit card bills, or there's things that we want to buy. And so we just keep working and working, trying to get them. And in a way, these things that happened to us came across as, as a blessing, because suddenly we didn't have a choice anymore. We lost the house, everything went down the tubes, and we said, we've got to do something else. So, so let's move into a yurt, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I forgot Tim Cook. It was one more of those examples along the route. Anybody own an Apple computer? <laughs> he was the biggest earner this year, 376 million. And again, you can't really make out those little dots, but it would take 945,000 of us buying these $400 iPads just to provide for that one man's. That was part of what gave us that feeling. This brought it back to earth for us, because those numbers were too big. Average earner in the US, 1977 an hour. John Donahoe is Mr. eBay. He's right in the middle of our top 100 earners. Not big, outstanding guy, but that's, that's an hourly wage for him. So as I said, we just felt like we had to escape. So a yurt is a, there's a structure called a gare in Mongolia. And the nomadic people, they roll 
Um, wool. It's wool, yeah. And, and so it's this thick walled, short. My brother was two years in Mongolia and lived in one. And um, very short structure that can withstand Mongolian winters. But this is the US version of it, right? It was much more plush. A little skylight on the top. But still, it was a 20-foot structure, 20 feet across. And we had no electricity, no running water. Um, we um, set it up. It sets up fairly quickly. Yeah, you know that place. <laughs> It was some friends of ours who had been living in this before us. They had spent a year with their um, newborn child. And so they were moving out of it and willing to give it to a young, broke couple for a very, very, very reasonable monthly payment, which we were happy to know was not going to Bank of America, but was going to this couple to fuel their dreams. And so we, we settled in. And, and there was our little home. Some friends of ours let us live on their land. And we knew we weren't going to Eden this time. This felt like a desperate escape. But we knew that we were going to learn something there, at least. We just weren't sure what. And so this was the middle of, of a super hot summer. We spent a lot of time just fanning each other with these sections of cardboard box that we had used, <laughs> that we had used in, the, in the move. And yeah, mosquitoes were terrible. But, but in a way, we didn't have to work so hard now. You know, our, our expenditures had gone way, way, way down. And we started to feel like, more of a sense of peace and family. Even though we didn't have a lot of the things that we thought we needed, we were having this new connection with each other, living in a little 20-foot circle, that we couldn't get living in a house that had all these different rooms. And so, I think, was maybe the first night there that Rebecca said, you know, this is, this is going to be tough to live here for me, she said. I'm just really used to a lot of, of, of things, you know. And it was always my kind of dream to go live in a little hut in the woods. So she wasn't, <laughs> so I felt like, oh, this is great. But she was more realistic about how it would be. But she also said, but you know what, Ken? We have it great here compared to most of the people in the world. We have fresh, clean water, and we're going to be warm. And there's a house a third of a mile away, you know, where our friends lived, where we can, where we can go if we need to use electricity. We know we have enough money to have food. And so that was a huge wake-up call for me when she said that, because it was this thing of like, we can strip down to becoming super sustainable, but we're still living pretty high on the hog, so to speak. We were using about three gallons of water a day. We kept a, a measurement of it. And we didn't have running water, of course, but we had walking water, my friend called it, because it was a little glass thing, and you turn this, and the water would trickle out. So it was gravity-fed. And, and that was used for, for washing, and washing dishes, and for cooking and drinking. And we had the house that we could go up to. So you know we did go make that walk, and we'd use their washing machine sometimes, and their shower once in a while, very sparingly. And, and we could hook up our computer. We used about $9 a month in electricity up at their at their house when we looked at the end of the year. And so even though we were using a lot less, we started 
to feel almost more depressed than ever because we were using less, but we still were so cognizant of how much we were using. And we drove our car once a week, but every time we'd get into that car, we'd be just spewing stuff into the environment. And, you know, we'd buy clothes and we'd buy groceries from the grocery store and there'd be packaging. And we were just, we were using a lot of stuff in our minds. And as the year progressed, we started to get this feeling of how much we would have to reduce to the point where we felt like we were really making a difference. And it seemed like, like, where is that? Like we'd have to live in a hut in the woods. That was basically the only way we could really be living a sustainable life. Being plugged in, I guess that's kind of the word that I'm using these days. It's even if we, we started to think, okay, we could live here long term, we'll get a, a solar electric hookup, and we'll replace our car with an electric car. And the thought of plugging that car in, you know, and then starting to realize on a deeper level that even if we got a car that used, had no emissions and had used no electricity, somehow just ran on nothing, we were still plugged into a system that was utilizing that. We were driving it on a road that required petroleum, which required, you know, mining and trucks and shipping and railroads and factories and refineries. And when we purchased a piece of clothing, you know, what goes into that? Or a pair of shoes? Or if we bought, you know, some granola from the grocery store? <coughs> so much interconnection. We started to really become cognizant of that feeling of for us, it wasn't being positively interconnected, but negatively interconnected. Like every single action we did had this impact that just reached out, and we felt like we were just raping the earth. And where to go from here? That's strangely when we started to develop a, a compassion for the CEOs that we had so maligned not too long ago. What a compassion for these people that are earning, earning so, so much. Remember Mr. eBay? 29.7 million is what he brings in a year. So to, that, to me, that seems like an inconceivable amount of money. But we were reminded that there are people on the earth living with less than a dollar a day. And that figure, you know, if you research how that's made, it doesn't mean an American dollar a day. It's the equivalent of a dollar of purchasing power, you know. And people are living on that. And you can't see, I have a black screen up here, <laughs> right? So there's the black. And why I have a black screen is that that black screen, as our people get smaller and smaller, has pixels, has 1,300,000 pixels at the screen resolution that I'm using. And so, if each of those pixels is a person, if we lined up 10 screens that way, that's how many people on this planet are living on less than a dollar a day. And we looked at Mr. eBay, earning that 27.9 million. And then we looked the other way at those people earning less than a dollar a day. And we sort of had this feeling of, here's us, here's Mr. eBay. It's that same situation. He might look like he's living like a sultan to us, but we look like we're living like sultans to this inconceivable number of people. Um, 
this was, as you can probably imagine, kind of a downward spiral into a state of, like, this is all hopeless. And, and there really is, is no solution except that one I mentioned, which was to go live in the hut in the woods, right? And we'll gather our berries and acorns. And maybe we'll have no bad effect on the earth when we're, when we're doing that. <laughs> yeah, she likes the woods because <laughs> she's been out there a lot. Um, That was the toughest and best year of our life, living in the yurt. Because I think we finally found our answer. And the answer was that, you know, we could reduce our consumption. We could become more and more sustainable on paper. But we weren't in a state that was emotionally sustainable. And if we weren't emotionally sustainable in the state that we were in, then we wouldn't stick to it. And we'd end up consuming more and not really living up to our sense of integrity about things. And action doesn't happen by itself. That kept going through, through my mind. You know that action springs from our, the consciousness that we're engaged in, right? So if I have a very nurturing consciousness, my actions are automatically going to be nurturing. And if I have a consciousness that sees the things around me as something that is just there for my use, then that's what's going to start to come out of, out of my actions. And so intrinsic versus extrinsic is the way Rebecca likes to say it. And you know, it works with child rearing too. Are we teaching? our children, teaching ourselves to have an intrinsic motivation so that we're acting out of our heart, or are we still acting out of an extrinsic motivation, out of fear or guilt about how we should be, you know, more sustainable to the earth. And if we think of humans as part of nature instead of separate, then I think a big shift can start to happen in the way that we're sustainable, in our consciousness. So, before we are always thinking, here's humans, here's the earth, and we're basically just destroying it. When we started to think of ourselves as integrated with the earth, we started to develop what I call an ecological consciousness, meaning that, you know, an, an ecological view of the Earth sees, sees that all the elements of a system are integrated. And it understands that impact is not localized. Even our attitude, our consciousness that we hold, is not just localized. It has a broad impact, and it affects our actions. So, so I may strive towards being more sustainable, right? But what's my deep inner attitude towards other humans? that are a part of this earth, including Mr. eBay. If I'm riding a bike and I come up to a stoplight and this kid in an F-350 Ford that says, you know, loud pipes save lives comes up and, and sits next to me at the stoplight, I can feel like everything I'm doing here, positive, is being negated by his actions, right? And I can be like, <laughs> and what's he probably going to do? Break the mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> Give it right back. And so when I have an alienating attitude towards those people around me, I'm a co-active participant right there in that little imaginary situation of having him rev his engine and do a little bit more destruction. If I'm just there on my bike and I maybe smile and wave and I honestly have good feelings towards that person, then, <laughs> then maybe, you know, he's going to come to his own conclusions, but at least there's a small chance left that he'll look down and go, wow, neat looking bike. Maybe that'd be kind of cool to try biking sometime. Maybe not likely, but there's a chance. There's a chance that's negated as soon as I tell him what for. And 
So, when I look around at all of us that are being sustainable, I think and I hope that we can all start to develop like an ecological consciousness. And I don't know what you thought about those figures in the beginning of all those CEOs that are earning so much. But when we look at them and we see them as monsters, I think that in a subtle way we are co-participating in making them less sustainable. And I wonder what would happen if we would look and we would say, maybe this isn't about greed, but maybe this is about addiction. And when we look at Mr. eBay earning that, all that millions and millions of dollars, and we see him as a monster, then we're doing two things. First of all, we're ignoring our own sultanhood, right? Because remember, to that 1.3 billion people, we are living so high that it's inconceivable. <clears throat> you know, when we go out and we purchase a $400 iPad, do we really need this to, to make our life better? Our decision. But that money could obviously more than double the income of one of, that, one of those 1.3 billion people. You know, what if somebody doubled your income next year? And we could do that with just saying, I'm not going to buy an iPad. I'm going to, you know, somehow get that money to one of those 1.3 billion people. And developing that sense, no matter how sustainable you're living, that sense of compassion, that sense of knowing that you know, we live now, oh yeah, car. <laughs> we live now at a little place called Bubbling Springs, there's a picture of it in a second, that uh, it's, a, it's a community, a family-based community that the water comes from, from wind power, a lot of the uh, heated water comes from uh, solar electric, a high percentage of the food is, is grown or raised or wild gathered on the land. And so it feels like those are good steps in the right direction, but it also feels like we know, we have that sense that we're also living like sultans. And so keeping that, that mindset in our head has helped us to start to be open to really looking at sustainability in a new way. Our car is getting old. It's got 230,000 miles on it now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much longer it's going to last. And of course, we have thought, you know, get an electric car or a hybrid or something like that. But now, when we're thinking with an ecological mindset, we start to see not only the big picture in a broad way, but the little picture, you know, our life, we start to notice more of where real, genuine happiness emerges in our life. And we start to question things, like, do we really need a car? And I think when this car dies, there's going to be some serious discussions about maybe sharing a car with a friend, or maybe b biking or walking the eight miles into town. And we wouldn't have had those discussions before, because we were really addicted, you know, to the sense of security that a car gave us. And now, it seems a little more adventurous to think about, how could we live without a car? What would that look like? And that might be fun. And that's what makes it emotionally sustainable. So now, we're living much higher than we did on the yurt, when we were living in the yurt. But, we're slowly getting more sustainable, I think, and we're doing it in a way that comes out of heart and comes out of a good feeling of, of adventure and excitement. And that means that the changes we're making are going to be emotionally sustainable. And we're not going to hit the place we hit in the yurt where it was like, we just cannot do this anymore. As great as it is in many ways, it's just 
painful in so many others. And so, um, you know, this is other people getting around in, in other ways besides cars. People in our culture do it. There's Bubbling Springs. The yurt is now a yoga studio and a mindfulness studio where we teach seminars. And we ended up founding our business, Weird Wild University, which I don't think we would have conceived of this before because we weren't in that, that ecological consciousness, you know? But here, we created a business that, to us, feels super sustainable. We're just taking people out into the woods, you know, and reconnecting them with nature. So we are consuming very little resources in the action and hopefully connecting people more with, with their natural life. And I think that's really the, the moral of our story, was just that there's this, there's this thing called an ecological consciousness. And if we, if we capture that for ourselves, and we concentrate on ourselves developing that, then that reaches out and our actions are naturally going to become more sustainable in an emotionally sustainable way. And I look at the policies that we're laying down and the laws that we're laying down these days and think, these are necessary, but we have to recognize that they're coming with a price. Because when we force an action out of somebody, we know we can force an action, but we can't force their heart. And so we get at people that are maybe obeying the letter of the law, but aren't obeying the spirit of the law. And if I could leave us with anything today, it would be that each of us, in our quest towards more sustainability, turn that into ourselves to developing a sustainable consciousness, where when people see us being sustainable in the usual way, they see us doing that from a heartfelt, joyful place. And they don't see somebody that says, I am more sustainable than thou. So when we give that message, you know, we nix a whole world of possibilities that could open when we reach out to somebody in a positive way. And I, I'm going to hope and imagine that all of us are doing that and living that in our own way. This festival is a great place to do it, where people get to come and see people excited about the solar, you know, setup that they have, excited about the, the gardening that they're doing excited about the new electric vehicle. And so I would like to take a moment to thank all of you for the own, your, your, your own quest towards sustainability and to hope that we all can remember to just turn that in and not look at anybody else as a monster, but maybe as an addict that could use a little bit of love and guidance. Thank you. <laughs> this program was recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.